So, good day, guys. Welcome to our lesson today. We're going to talk about the trig trigonometric ratios, the trig ratios, and then we're going to extend the idea of the ratios to create functions. And so, one of the things that we know is from geometry, we should know at least three trig ratios already from our geometry classes. So I'm going to be reminding you about those. And then we're going to learn the other three trig ratios. And then we're going to develop and see why all of these ratios could actually lead to a function. And then we're going to talk about the inverse function of each of these and actually solve um, some simple equations with these. Um, things, all of these things are things you probably should have done in a geometry class, except maybe the function part. Uh, you probably waved your hands at this, right? Waved your hands, a little vibration here on the hand. But we probably waved our hands at that in a geometry class. But um, in general, other than that, we're going to talk about the trig ratio. So I've got a few right triangles drawn above. And a couple of the things that we need to always know, we need to always know where the right angle is in the right triangle. Okay, That always occurs where two sides are perpendicular. And then what we do is we name these sides, okay? So the side that is opposite the right angle is always called the hypotenuse. Okay, and so this will be a hypotenuse and this will be a hypotenuse for that triangle. So no matter where that right angle is, the side that's opposite it, it doesn't make the right angle, all right? It's on the interior of the right angle. It connects the two rays, if you wish. That's always the hypotenuse. Then the other two sides, those are called legs, all right? So we have a leg there and a leg there, and we have a leg here and a leg here and a leg here, and a leg here. Legs always make the right angle. Those are actually two line segments that are part of the two rays that make the angle, okay? Uh, legs are always perpendicular to each other. So what that leaves us then is that leaves us the two acute angles. So we're going to call this angle A here, and we're going to call this one up here angle B. All right. Now, when you are given the acute angles, if you choose one of those acute angles, so say I choose the acute angle B, okay? If I choose that angle, then that all of a sudden names my... Uh, legs. It gives my legs a name. So the leg that will be over here that does not make up angle B will be called the opposite leg. And the leg that actually is a part of angle B is going to be called the adjacent leg. Uh, whoops, forgot my J. Adjacent leg. So, opposite means not next to, all right? And adjacent means next to. So, that's one of the ways. It's sort of the next to leg and the leg that's not next to, all right? One of the things you have to make sure you do is not mix up the adjacent leg with the hypotenuse, okay? Because the hypotenuse also makes that angle. Now, you can move that angle around. If, uh, you know, if this was angle B over here, then this would become the opposite leg and this would become the adjacent leg. And so wherever angle B goes, if that's the one I choose, then that determines what I call the legs. However, if I move angle B, 
and instead of choosing angle B, I choose angle A, then this is now no longer adjacent to angle A, it now becomes the opposite to angle A. And this one becomes adjacent or next to angle A. So the labels opposite and adjacent can switch based on the angle that you choose. And that's a big deal. And a lot of kids made mistakes with that in geometry in eighth grade when you probably studied these things before. But in trigonometry, you are not allowed to make that mistake. You want to clear that up in your head and make sure once you choose your angle, that's what determines opposite and adjacent. Okay, let's go on. So I'm going to, here's a triangle, a right triangle, all drawn out. So I have a good idea what it is. I've labeled each of the vertices of the right triangle ABC. C is the right angle, so line segment AB is the hypotenuse. And then I'm going to choose angle A. So therefore, the leg CB is going to be the opposite, and the leg CA is going to be the adjacent leg. Once I do that, I can then set up the trig ratios. The trig ratios are defined to be the following. All right, we say the sine of angle A is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse. Now notice, the sine of an angle, this is an expression that goes together, is equal to a ratio of sides. And you need to remember this forever. And this goes for the other five I'm going to write right now. The cosine of angle A will equal the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. The tangent of angle A is equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side. And then we're going to do the other three ratios. And the other three ratios are called the cosecant of angle A, the um, secant of angle A and the cotangent of angle A. So I've written out the words here. I'll show you the abbreviations on the next slide. Now, the cosecant of angle A is just the reciprocal, reciprocal of sine. Okay, so it's going to be the hypotenuse over the opposite. All right, the secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So it's going to be the hypotenuse over the adjacent. And cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. All right, and that is equal to the adjacent over the opposite. All right, now in general, we mostly use these three ratios, but the reciprocal ratios show up in various things. Now, notice it's not the co that connects the reciprocals, the co co functions are a completely different thing. But the reciprocal de definitions are listed here, and there's a reason that they're reciprocal definitions. And I'm going to try and fuzzily explain this. You can look this up on your own, but I'll show you something here on another to that slide, and let me shrink it instead. If instead, it, here's how these words came about, okay? If you drew a circle... Okay, 
And so I'm going to draw a circle like this with the center of the circle at the origin, okay? Um, in an ancient culture, all right, if you drew a chord of the circle so that it happened to be perpendicular to the diameter, uh, which is the x-axis, part of the x-axis. So we drew a chord, and from there then we made a right triangle by drawing a radius of the circle, okay? It turns out that in the language that this was first done, the word for chord, all right, the word for chord was sine. All right, and if you looking at my diagram here, and now I'm going to blow up my diagram. I'm going to make it bigger. <laughs> okay, the word for chord was sine, and so that word over time began to be associated with this side right here. And so when the subject of trig, it began to be associated with essentially a half chord, all right? So it, it was associated with this part right here, just this part. It got to be associated with that. So if I let my, if this is a circle and we say it's of, uh, that this is the hypotenuse, and we choose this angle at the origin right here, then this side becomes the opposite and the trig ratio that is opposite over hypotenuse is called the sine. And that's how the words came about. So what would the cosine be? Well, it would be the one that is the adjacent. It would look at this other side of the right triangle. So that was kind of the cosine. So where did the tangent come from? Well, the tangent came from the fact that you could draw a tangent line at this point. And it would also, let me do this in a different color. So you draw a tangent line at that point, and it would create a triangle that just so happened to be similar to our original right triangle. Okay? And when you made the ratio opposite over adjacent, uh, the angle you were looking at was this one, and this became the opposite. Notice it would be in proportion to our original half chord, and so opposite over adjacent. And that's how the tangent came about. And then the secant, and I'm not sure if I remember this one. Oh my gosh, I hope I can remember. I'm trying to think of what two points gave us the secant and the cosecant. Gosh, I'm sorry, I can't remember. But it turns out we, a, a secant, if you'll remember, is a line, a, a secant from geometry is a line through two points of a circle. It intersects two points. And I can't remember how to draw it as a part of this diagram, so I apologize. Um, I'm not sure where it goes. There are lots of choices for points. I think it's probably, no, it's not that one. It, it might go through this point right here. There's lots of point choices, but I think you draw it parallel to that. And it turns out that this right triangle here is similar to this one here, and we get the secant ratio from using that triangle. In any case, um, 
uh, that's how these came about. And it, it just comes from another language, what they call the chord of a circle. And as they made these ratios, that's how they named them. So just briefly, how do we typically write it? We usually write the sine of an angle A is the opposite side over the hypotenuse. The cosine of an angle A is the adjacent over hypotenuse. The tangent of angle A is the opposite over the adjacent. So we can abbreviate that. And if you look at this and you grab the letter S, O, H, like that, then you can make a mnemonic device. Yes, good old mnemonics. I hope I spelled that right. Probably not quite. Uh, forget the E, mnemonic device, which is like a memorized thing, and you probably remember this from geometry, the old Soka Toa, which tells us sine is opposite over hypotenuse, Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. Now, if you can't spell, then just remember this. Sum old horse came a hopping through our alley. All right? So some old horse came hopping through our alley, and those first letters will help you remember the Soka Toa, and then from there you can write the main three ratios. Then the only other thing you have to remember is which one is the reciprocal, and you can write those ratios. So here's a, a typical problem you might encounter. I'd really well. Let me back up. Let me go. A typical problem I've often put on a midterm would be um, given the following right triangle. So I'll give a right triangle here and I'll call this like six and this like, um, oh, let's not do six. Let's do five, five and 13 like that. And I'll say uh, this is angle A down here. And then the question will say, write the six trig ratios for this triangle. Okay? So since you only know the opposite and the adjacent, uh, that means we need to find this other side here. Now, since it's a right triangle, we get to use our old friend, yes, yes, the Pythagorean theorem. So, uh, since that's opposite, excuse me, this is not adjacent, this is the hypotenuse, and this is the adjacent. So, the Pythagorean theorem will be the opposite squared plus the adjacent squared equals the hypotenuse squared. So in our problem, that's 5 squared plus a squared equals 13 squared. So 25 plus a squared equals 169. So a squared equals 144. So a will equal 12. Not plus or minus 12, just 12 because... Um, uh, this is a length, so it has to be a positive number, okay? It's not just algebra at this point. It's actually geometry, so we have to do the positive. Once you have all three of those, then you can write the ratios. The sine of angle A is equal to the opposite, 5 over 13. The cosine of angle A is equal to the adjacent over hypotenuse, 12 over 13. The tangent of angle A is equal to the opposite over the adjacent. And then we can write the cosecant of angle A, which is equal to 13 over 5. And the secant of angle A, which is equal to 13 over 12. 
and then the cotangent of angle A, which is 12 over 5. All right, and that is the basics of how you would find and write ratios. Now, a great friend in trigonometry is going to be the Pythagorean theorem. Okay? And so I want you to remember that because we are going to use the Pythagorean theorem lots and lots and lots. And so it's really important that you remember it and are able to use it at a moment's notice because you never know when that moment will be. So I want to play a little game with you. Um, I want to show you something about right triangles a little bit. Oops, let me go here, there, that's better. So here's a right triangle, okay? And here's a right triangle. And uh, since they're both right triangles, that's good. And I'm going to tell you that both of them have an angle of 35 degrees here. So what can you say about these two right triangles? Geometrically speaking, what could you say about these two right triangles geometrically speaking? Okay, yes, that is right. You could say they are similar. How, why could you say you, they are similar? By the angle-angle theorem, right? If two angles of one triangle are congruent to two angles of another triangle, then the triangles are congruent. And since we have a 90-degree angle and a 35-degree angle, we now know that the triangles are similar because of the angle-angle similarity theorem, okay? I think I said congruent, but I meant similar, okay? And when triangles are similar, the ratios are equal, okay? So, for instance, if this was 6 and this was 10, and I said this side was 12, okay, then because the triangles are similar... I could set up a proportion and find out what this long side is in the other triangle. You remember doing this in geometry? And so we get x equals 20. So if this leg is twice as big as its corresponding leg, the hypotenuse will be twice as big. And et cetera, et cetera. Whatever this leg is here, down here, this leg will be half the size of it. Okay? And we'd use proportions to figure that out. Now, if we have these two similar triangles, what I want to show you is a really interesting thing. So let's just do the cosine here of 35 degrees. All right? That's going to equal 6 over 10 in the small triangle, which reduces to 3 fifths. If I take the cosine of 35 in the big triangle, I get 12 over 20, which is also 3 fifths. So what that means is that if I have any right triangle and they all have one acute angle in common, then all their trig ratios are going to be the same. Now, I've just showed you for, cos for cosine, but if I find this other side over here, I could do this for sine and tangent and cosecant and secant and cotangent. I could show you that they're all going to reduce to the same value for each trig ratio. That's a big deal. You know what that means? That means that a trig ratio only has one particular value. Okay? Which means that it's a one-to-one -one function. 
whatever values I put in to the trig function, I get an, a, a y value out that's unique. It doesn't change. Okay? So even though it looks like I have two different values, the ratios are actually going to be the same, exactly the same. And I could, I could make a bigger triangle, bigger right triangle, and if this angle was 35 degrees, I'm still going to get three-fifths. Okay? And that's going to happen every time. What this means is each trig ratio is one-to-one, -one, and if it's one-to-one -one for all values, for all angles, then that means it's going to be a function. And that means each trig ratio is a function, okay? Now, I'm going to show you another way to show that they're functions tomorrow. But, um, or maybe not tomorrow, maybe the next day. Um, but it, it's enough for us to know that it's a function, that we could do it this way as well. So one of the things you want to be able to do is to find values on a calculator. And we'll review this in class and I'll actually show you with a graphics calculator. But I want to mention a couple of things. And you're going to see problems like this. Okay? On a calculator, you have what is called a mode. And that mode needs to be correct for every trig problem. You need to check your mode and make sure it is on the correct setting for each and every trig problem, or you're going to end up doing the problem wrong. Okay? So, uh, real quickly, if you see the sign of 42 degrees like this, it will have the degree symbol, and you will know that these are degrees. Okay? And so, that means you need to change your calculator to degree mode, and then you can hit the sign button and type 42 and the calculator will give you the right value. Okay? So hang on here. Uh, sorry, I'm getting the right calculator, I apologize. Okay? Got to have a calculator in my hand. So if I put my calculator into degree mode, then I'm going to be able to do the problem correct. Okay? And so I could do the sign of 42 degrees, and it would give me the ratio is 0.6691. So as a matter of standard, unless they tell me to round off, in general, we go four des decimal places. That's sort of the traditional way to do it, unless they ask you to round off, okay? And they will. They'll say round to the nearest hundredth, so you put 0.67 if they said that, okay? So always pay attention to that part of the directions. Um the second thing is if you don't see a degree symbol, it's automatically radians. So if that's the case, you have to change your calculator to radian mode. So then I could type the sign and then do pi over 7. Okay? So however I do pi hang on this calculator, I'm not using my other one. There it is. So I would do pi um, divided by, and I got to go back and find the division. Oh my. You picked the wrong calculator here. Divided by 7. And so if you do this on your calculator, then you would type sign, and then you'd hit find your pi key. Do not use 3.14 anymore. Find the pi key on your calculator and type pi and then divide it by 7. So this is what it would look like on your calculator. And you would get that the ratio is 0.4339 if you rounded it. Okay? 
0.4339. All right. Now, this is going to be a tricky one. Uh, let, me, uh, let me change this problem just a little bit. It's not giving me the eraser. Here we go. There we go. Uh, let me change it. And so it says sine 42. So now when you look at this, you go, oh, that's 42 degrees. But the answer is no, because it doesn't have the degree symbol. This is radians. So you're going to type sine 42, and you're going to check and see if the mode on your calculator is radians. And so you do the sine of 42. And in this case, you would get that the ratio is a negative 0.9165. Okay? Now, when you do direct calculator work like this, these are always going to be decimal values like that. Okay? And it doesn't matter, again, because all the triangles are similar, sine of 42, whether it's in a small triangle, 42 degrees, or a large triangle, 42 degrees, or it's a 42 radian angle in that triangle, or pi over 7 radians, you're always going to get the same decimal value every time for each one of those. All right? Every trig problem, you must check your mode. Make it a habit now. Okay? Because if you don't make it a habit, you're going to miss problems just because of this one thing. All right? Now I can't pause my video. So I want to talk a little bit about what the co-functions are. So if we think sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant, how are those related? Okay, so we've already seen a reciprocal relationship between sine and cosecant, cosine and secant, and tangent and cotangent. So what's the co-function relationship? Okay, the co-function relationship, and by the way, these angles aren't quite correct for these side links, but let's just pretend that they are, okay? Um, in any case, what's the co-function relationship? Well, here's what it is. If this is angle B and this is angle A, if I take the sine of 40 degrees which is angle B up here, okay, then that is going to be written as 6 over 10, okay? However, if I take the cosine of 50 degrees, that changes this to the adjacent side, and that is also 6 over 10, so the co-function relationship has to do with these angles being complementary. And do you remember what complementary was in geometry? The angles add to their sum equals 90 degrees, right? So co-functions have to do with the fact that the sine and the cosine of complementary angles are equal. So you could even say the sine of 50 is equal to the cosine of 40, all right? And you could say the tangent of 40 is equal to the cotangent of 50, all right? Now, you can play this game with radians as well. So you just need to know that 90 degrees is equal to uh, pi over 2 radians, okay? And so if, I'm, uh, if I were to do this in radians, like say I said this was, um, this angle here was equal to like uh, 1 radian, then I'd say, oh, the sine of one radian um, uh, is equal to 6 over 10, all right? 
And then the co-function that would be equal to that, the way I would write that is I'd say the cosine, and I'd have to take pi over 2, the 90 degrees, minus whatever the degrees are for 1. So pi over 2 minus 1 is also going to be equal to 6 tenths. And so the way we write co-functions is kind of interesting. We say the sine of some angle theta is equal to the cosine of 90 minus theta if they're in degrees. And the sine of theta is equal to the cosine of pi over 2 minus theta if they're in radians. And this is a cofunction relationship. And you can switch this around. You could put cosine here and sine here. That is also correct. You could put tangent here and cotangent here, uh, keeping the, either the angles or the radian statement the same. And that is going to be your cofunction relationship. Okay? And then, of course, secant and cosecant. Okay? So it's a big deal. So right now you have learned what are called the reciprocal identities. And you have learned the co-function identities. And uh, probably the next lesson or the one after that, I'm going to show you how to write these down on a separate sheet of paper and how to put them in your notes. Okay? Because uh, you want to have a separate sheet of paper for something called identities. Because they're gonna we're gonna it's gonna be quite a list of 30 or so. So just something to keep in mind. Okay. And so you need a reciprocal section and a cofunction section. All right, next slide. So um, the final thing that we need to do is we need to um, uh, talk about the inverse functions. So we've now figured out on a calculator, we can do like the sine of 40 degrees and we can find the ratio as a decimal or we could do the sine of pi over 6 radians and we can find the ratio as a decimal. So we can do that for everything on our calculator, making sure that we're in the right mode every time we punch something like that on our calculator. So what if we have the other problem? What if we say the sine of some angle theta is equal to 6 over 10? So we already know the ratio either as a fraction or as a decimal. Most of the time, just so you know, you're going to know the ratio as a fraction. The only time you ever write a decimal is when you do it with the calculator. Uh, most of the time, you're going to know the ratio because it's going to come from a triangle. And so suppose I have this diagram here, and this is 6, and this is 10, and this is my angle theta. And I want to know what theta is. Well, this is a little bitty equation. It's an equation. And I want to solve the equation. Well, how do I solve equations? The way to solve equations is to undo things. Remember, on square roots, we undid them by squaring. And squares, we undid by square roots. And cubes, by cube roots. And we also undo, we did, undid natural logarithms by e to the x. And um, we undid 2 to the power of x with the log base 2 of both sides. So we used inverse functions. So what we want to do is we want to use the inverse function of sine. And so this will present to us the inverse function which is written in two ways. And so the two ways you can write it are arc sine, like this, or you can write inverse sine. Now, whenever you put the negative 1, kind of like an exponent, 
but you put it on a function, that means it's an inverse function. And we know this because we wrote the inverse function like this. Okay? But when that negative 1 is really an exponent and not telling us it's an inverse function, then what we do is we would write the whole function sine x. And if I want it to be an exponent, I would do this. So this is equal to 1 over sine x, which is actually the reciprocal of sine, so it's cosecant x. All right? That's what that's equal to. But this means the inverse function of sine. Okay? So that's a really important thing for you to remember and to keep straight. Okay? Really important. Okay? So what we're going to do here basically is we're going to take the inverse sine of both sides. And the inverse sine of sine, these undo each other because they're inverses, and we get the angle equals the inverse sine of 6 tenths. Now notice, an inverse trig function of a ratio is actually equal to an angle. When you go to your calculator, the inverse trig functions... Um, are usually above your key. So if you have a sine key, the inverse sine is up here. Okay? Got it? And that'll be your inverse function. Okay? So I can actually calculate what this angle is. Now, I'm going to do it both ways. First, I'm going to do it in radians. Okay? in radians. So on my calculator, I'm going to find the inverse sine of the inverse sine of 6 tenths. Okay? So 6 divided by 10. Now I'm done with that problem. So I can type the answer. And it gives me point 6435 radians. Okay, that's equal to the angle. So those are radians. Okay, now if I put my calculator in degree mode and I do the very same problem, okay. So I do the inverse sine of 6 tenths. And, whoops, I didn't, I had it in degree mode and then I punched it back to radians. I apologize. So the inverse sine of 6 divided by 10. Okay. And then that gives me 36 point nine degrees is equal to theta okay so you have to pay attention in the problem if it wants the answer in radians or degrees now just for kicks as a reminder from our last lesson if i take this 0.6435 and i multiply it times 180 over pi that should give me the number of degrees. I should get about 36.9, right? So let's try that. 0. 0.6435 times 180 divided by pi. It's not letting me type the pi. There we go. And I get 36.9 degrees. All right. There's a little bit of round off error in decimals, but that's because I rounded this off. But you can see that now I can check and see if my radian answer 
matches my degree answer, and if they do, then that means I've done it correctly. All right? So that's all. This is kind of a long lesson. It was a long section. Lots to do. If you have questions, bring them to class on Thursday or to office hour today. All righty. Bye-bye.